All right, I'd like to welcome you to this final session of our conference. This is just an informal panel where we will be, all of the afternoon participants will be answering questions. And to begin, every panelist is just going to give a little one to two minute synopsis of her paper, and then we'll start taking questions. Hi, I'm Sherilyn Olson, and I did not write a paper, so I won't, I won't give you a synopsis of that. I'm the co-editor-in-chief at Segala, and we are a literary and visual arts magazine. Uh, we have a blog and a journal, and I'm happy to be here. In case you've forgotten, I'm Linda Hoffman Kimball, and I am an emeritus exponent board member and the current co-editor-in-chief with my friend of Segula and, um, and a founding member of Mormon Women for Ethical Government. So I'm not sure which hat I should be wearing, but I guess I'll wear them all. So here we go. I'm Heather Sundahl. I'm here representing um, Exponent 2 organization, the magazine, the blog, the uh, Facebook group, and we also have a really gorgeous coloring book called Illuminating Ladies, and it is so beautiful. We have pictures of, of Heavenly Mother in here, and we have um, just really lots of amazing, amazing stuff, so. And Lisa Tate, and I just gave a brief overview of uh, historical Latter-day Saint women's publications. I'm Jana Reese, and I presented data of today about Mormon women and men, and I'm the, uh, the author of the book The Next Mormons that just came out a week ago. My name is Nancy Ross, and uh, this afternoon I spoke about the history of the law, obedi law of Obedience Covenant in the endowment and how that has become more confusing over time. I'm Amy Hoyt, and I spoke about um, the way that gender roles have been employed within families in America, Botswana, and South Africa. I must say I am astonished that everyone actually only took one minute. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, so that was fast, and now we have a lot of time for Q&A. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to open it up to the panelists and ask, do you have any questions for each other that you didn't get a chance to talk about or make comments on other people's presentations? I have all sorts of questions about the changes of the wording in the temple, but I, I don't know that... Um, uh, I don't, I don't want to pile the thousands of questions I have all on Nancy, but if there's any, anything more you want to say, I'd be interested to hear. Um, you know, just after I gave the presentation, um, some women came up to me and asked me if, you know, am I gonna do another one on the ceiling? Or, and I haven't looked that far. I've really b mostly been concerned with the law of obedience covenant. But I think that, that the implication here, or the potential implication is that if, you know, a lot of the a lot of the the talk in Mormonism has been about inheriting godhood eventually, but if women don't actually get that in the temple, um, but men seem to get something of that in the temple, then do women not get divinity in the next life? Is heavenly mother not divine? I f I feel like this particular covenant has a lot of knock on effect, um, which comes back to what does the afterlife look like for Mormon women? And I feel like that is a really important question. Um, it was a question that in many ways, um, after considering that for a while, contributed to the breaking of my own personal shelf. Because what if I had been sacrificing so much of my life for an afterlife that I've, and I was encountering other people's visions of the afterlife, but maybe I didn't actually want that. And, and, and so, so I, th I think that you know, there's the specifics of the language but I feel like the knock-on effect of what this means is actually very big. And I, and, and I think that we all, you know, as, as, as Mormon feminists, want to, you know, it, consider a Heavenly Mother who is divine, who, who is co-equal and co-eternal with God, um, who, an afterlife where there is equity. Um, but that's not 
it seems to be what is not that what's being laid out in the temple. And again, I just looked at one piece. There are lots more pieces. Um, but I, I, I really feel very strongly that we need to be having these conversations in the open. Um, because if you don't want the afterlife you are working for, you know, you should be able to have a say in whether or not you are working toward that. Um, I would also say that on the other end, that there is no in proper informed consent for the temple. You know, that mm -hmm. there is no going over the covenants that you will be making before you make them. And so, you know, when I went through six weeks before I married my husband, I remember being confronted with the Harkin covenant and feeling panicked and kind of looking around like, is anybody else hearing this? <laughs> um, and also doing the very quick mental math of, okay, if I don't agree with this, I don't marry him. That's a huge impact on my life, a covenant for which I was, which I was not prepared to make. And, and I think we've got to talk, begin to talk about informed consent with the temple. People have a right to know what they are committing to both in the moment and to choose in advance of going to the temple if that is a commitment they wish to make. Um, because I think if you are believing, and I was very believing when I made these covenants, that there are bits of this that can be damaging, deeply damaging. Um, not for everyone, I'm not saying everyone has the same experience, but it was for me, it was a secret shame that ultimately <coughs> dismantled my own sense of, it, it kind of finished off my self-worth. Mm. Um, and, Like that has got to be part of the conversation. I'm not saying that everyone has that experience because I know that everyone does not have that experience. But like, if this is supposed to be the most sacred thing you do in your whole entire life, then gosh darn it, it should be good. Thank you. I, I uh, read, I think just yesterday, a Facebook post from Mehdi Harrison talking about um, the hereafter and uh, as being brutal and exhausting and mm -hmm. I thought, and I've had a lot of thoughts about uh, the temple experience, and I remember sorting through for myself that um, principalities and powers and dominions is the last thing I want, and I do not want to be producing children for forever <laughs> because that's just <laughs> exhausting, and, and toddlerhood, whatever, it's just not a picture I want. So I have in my mind thought, okay, this was, however that got here came through the mind of a 19th century man and maybe those kinds of things appeal to him. So I'm going to translate that into God is giving you, he's got shaker cans full of all the stuff you most want <laughs> and that's what he's showering down on you and that's the way I can manage that. No, and I, and, and I think that that, um, that claiming the agency to reconceive of that, um, you know, that is something that I had tried to do um, at a time in my life. But I think even claiming the ability to say, okay, well, I think I'm hearing some nonsense and I believe in a God that would not follow through on those awful promises. But that also then, if we can't talk about the language, how do we even get there? You know, like, I, and I, I feel like we have got to be willing, and I, and I know that, you know, that break cultural taboos, you know, in doing so, but I feel like we, we, we can and should have an open conversation about what women get in the afterlife with the ability for us to imagine many possibilities. But if we can't talk about it, then it's harder to envision the possibilities and our private our private secret experiences of the temple in our hearts can can shift in a lot of different ways. I think uh, for me, I have discovered that uh, having a minimalist theology works best to keep me healthy. Yeah, And if Amen. I can focus yeah. on my savior, the grace of God. It's all about Jesus. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, cleaning <laughs> for Jesus. You, Heather gave a, a fabulous talk once about um, everything she does, she does for Jesus, whether that's driving home a tired teenager or cleaning up after some terrible mess, whatever. Uh, but minimalist theology works well mm -hmm. for me because most explanations I have heard mm -hmm. end up feeling abrasive in some way or another.
Any other questions from panelists to other panelists before we turn to the audience? Okay, I think I saw a question from the audience over here, yes? Please use the microphone. They are on their way. Okay, this question's for Nancy and Lisa. I don't know if how much you'll know about this question. Um, I, I was struck by Nancy's comment that it's not the responsibility of women to keep their secondary status secretive. I also felt very a very strong reaction to the request that we not talk about this after the recent temple changes. Um, in your research, Nancy or Lisa or anyone, has there ever been a time where Mormons have talked openly about their temple worship amongst themselves um, in the Relief Society? Has there some time where we can point to the past that this was open? When did it become more taboo to, be sec to not be talked about? Or has it always been that way? So that's my first question. And two, um, have you done, Nancy, any research or considered research into the covenant not to criticize the Lord's anointed? And could that possibly prohibit or contribute to the secrecy and not talking about things? Because if the talking about things suggests unhappiness, not satisfied, that could be that could be interpreted as criticism and therefore contributes more to the secrecy. So does that make sense to any repeat? Sure. Okay. Um, for the f for the first question, and and I'm. I'm, I'm sure Lisa knows the answer to this much better than I do, I, is I don't know. But I, I think in, I did come across a quote in the first 50 years of Relief Society where Eliza R. Snow is saying, is, is telling a group of women or is writing something and she's saying that women become queens and priestesses to God. And I don't know if that is her inventing, you know, fixing, correcting, editing the temple language or if, um, that is actually the temple language that she encountered. I don't have a temple script from that time, but there may very well be other people who would know better than I would. To repeat myself, <laughs> <laughs> so this does not relate to the endowment script, but looking at historical evidence from Nauvoo, mm -hmm. there are, and then a little later, there are four pieces of historical evidence of women being ordained as priestesses to God. Mm -hmm. And I think that started to change um, not long after they left Nauvoo, but the what I see with the women who were endowed in Nauvoo, mm -hmm. that they always saw, they interpreted the temple in relationship to what they had experienced in Nauvoo with their endowment there. And so, and Eliza was one of those. I mean, in Laurel's book about a house full of females, she talks about how Eliza would carry the minutes, the Nauvoo Relief Society minutes uh, around with her, but um, yeah, there is historical evidence that the earliest endowments, women were <coughs> priestesses to God. And for me, um, just a, a little thing here, I've, I argued, I've been arguing for the last few years that I thought the t two most significant changes for women would be if they were ordained to priestesses to God. Mm -hmm. To me, that's really central for your eternal, yeah. you know, a view of yourself. The other thing is to add the Heavenly Mother to the temple. Mm -hmm. And that would not be hard. She's one of the Elohim. Mm -hmm. And, but that's probably, you know, both of those are radical, but th I think they fit with Mormon theology. Mm -hmm. So there is historical evidence that things were different, that there were some, you know, possibilities of other things again. And, and the very idea that things change should mean that we could, should talk about it and process it, right? But, it is a big taboo, right? So I don't know if you have anything to add, Lisa, to that, but. Well, <laughs> it's, it's long and complicated. Um, our sources for Nauvoo for earlier, they're, they're thin and they're spotty. 
And we know that the temple ceremony was not even written down until 1877. And then um, in the early 20th century, there was work done to standardize it across the, the different temples. So um, the, the, the kinds of things that Nancy says she has seen, I, I've seen those two, and those tend to take place um, within meetings, conferences, a lot of times small groups of 19th century Latter-day Saints where they're talking in an in-group way mm -hmm. where they will use language that we recognize as informed by their understanding of the temple. But in terms of explicit uh, discussion where they say, we will now talk about what goes on in the temple, no. No, the, the, the understanding from the beginning seems to have been that, that it was not something that was recorded or talked about openly. And even those Nauvoo sources, if you look at them many times, are journals or minutes that were taken in private, you know, meetings that would have been private were, that were not public meetings. And so the, the history of um, silence and reticence and and holding the, the temple sacred goes all the way back. I'd like to... Yeah. the importance of understanding certain aspects of the temple. And I, I remember a lot of open discussions for many years before I went through. And, and so this, this uh, type of fear of, of mentioning any part of it is very different from the first, you know, 40 years of my from life. From what you experienced. Yeah. And, well, and so I, I wonder how prevalent that was. It was so common for me, even from the time I was a child, that I would hear, you know, from relatives, but also church leaders and in church meetings, many references of aspects of the temple Mm. Not the the parts that are considered strictly, you know, that you covenant not to reveal. And so there was this distinction from my experience that there were different things uh, that you honor about the temple. It's not like you blatantly, we would blatantly talk about it in any circumstance, but that it was okay to talk about many aspects of it. And I find it interesting this massive shift in the attitude that what, what used to be spoken of with respect under many areas, I've had to you know, honor that people are much more uncomfortable about it and kind of introduce it in a different way. And, and I think it's true. If we feel okay about talking about it, we're going to feel okay about sharing varied experiences about it, about having a better understanding of you know, why some would be more upset than someone else because, uh, you know, I see it completely as symbolic, including the covenants, they're symbolic. I, not for a second do I think I've, any of those have anything to do directly with my eternal salvation. It's an experience that can be learned from, whereas someone else sees it as very literal. But only by talking about it can we get, oh, there are different ways to see this. But just from my experience, there were so many ways that we talked about it that seemed foreign to someone else. Thank you. And I'm sure we could talk, um, I mean, I, 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 we have no alternative to talking about it anecdotally because there hasn't been comprehensive historical work done that specifically examines that question of, and, and then it would be a difficult question to get at both in terms of, uh, because in, in the church, you have the, the grassroots, the, the member experience, the lived religion part, and then you have the hierarchical prescriptive discourse about what's supposed to happen. And then those two, uh, nav you know, we navigate between those two. And so there would be different ways of trying to get at that question of how have Latter-day Saints talked or not talked about the temple and what parts of it over time. Somebody can please write a dissertation about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the mandate is out there. <laughs> I'd like I, to add one thing. Um, can I jump in? Um, we, in the survey, kind of had a little bit to answer this part of your question about, about secrecy. Um, 
one thing that was a little bit surprising in the survey was that millennials reported the, the most positive first experiences of the temple of any generation, which if you look at some of the other data about millennials is surprising because some other things we see, an erosion of certainty, more questioning, questioning authority, but very positive experiences of the temple. And then we also had a question about temple preparation. When preparing for the first experience with the temple endowment ceremony, I received the most useful information about what to expect from a church-sponsored temple preparation class, one of the church leaders who interviewed me for a temple recommend, family and friends, books, the internet, or I did not receive any useful information. Only 6% of the millennials said they did not receive any useful information. 26% of the boomer silent generation said that they did not receive any useful information. So there is a correlation in the data between having good information and having a good experience. And, and, and I think also, Jana, to add to that, also the more recent temple ceremonies are, are not as, they're different <laughs> than when I went through in 1988. Um, I think, Jody, we all have had different experiences with what kind of preparation we have. I'm an example. I'm not a boomer, but I fall in that category. I had mm -hmm. zero prep. I, I had no idea what was going to happen when I went into the temple. So it was a very shocking <laughs> experience for me. And I was a BYU graduate. I was a seminary graduate, parents of very uh, active Latter-day Saints. Um, I was just going to add that um, I studied the origin of the um, endowment ceremony in my work, and it's heavily informed by the Masonic ceremonies wit in which those initiates are sworn to secrecy. And so I think that carried over, and I think that you know swearing to secrecy has existed since the beginning of, yeah. of our temple endowment ceremony as well. Just to continue our anecdotal discussion, I think <laughs> we will also find that if you look at older converts, that there is very much a difference in the way we prepared for the temple. I mean, yes, people told me I wasn't supposed to know, but I wasn't about to go through <laughs> something right. that, I, it, that I, you know, I'm, I mean, you know, sometimes people can do crazy things. So I wanted <laughs> to know what was I going to do. So I went online and I looked at the entire ceremony. I saw some things that I found troubling, but since I wasn't married, it didn't bother me that it said I was gonna be hearkening to you know, a husband because I didn't have a husband. And, and so I sort of erased a husband from everything and then that made it all uh, palatable to me. So, uh, but, but so I think you will find that, and certainly I know in our ward, we probably break the rules a little bit more and have more discussions about things because we don't want people, uh, and, and certainly among the, the black members in, in our ward, there's already maybe a little bit of distrust that they've had to overcome about the church. So you don't want people to go into something about which they know nothing. You want to prepare them. Jana, but others of you may be, want to weigh in as well. But just a question around social norming, around what's acceptable to discuss or not discuss. Because I think, you know, I, having taken courses from Eugene, England, I'm guessing that that home was different than the <laughs> home I was reared in, where they said nothing, you know, about the temple ceremony, and very different than the than the home where we raised our five children in, where we talked about all of the covenants with our children in preparation you know, for that experience. So there's a process of social norming around the way that we enact our religious identity that's at play here. And we make certain assumptions about what is and isn't acceptable based on that. Can you speak to that? <laughs> in five minutes or less. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> But more specifically, was there any particular area of, of you know, creating these social norms that you wanted to talk about well, in Mormonism? Yeah.
not to my knowledge exactly in what you're describing. I, if anyone else has an article reference that's coming to mind that would answer his question, chime in. There is a lot of research about habitus, you know, this, this general world that the, the social construction of religion, the sacred canopy, we have a lot of that. Um, it's particularly interesting to me, not living in Utah, uh, that what happens with all of us when we are all religious in the same way and we're all living in the same place and the effect that that has on religious orthodoxy, there's definitely been good research about that. Um, one thing I would say a little bit off, off topic, but you mentioned you know, the Cambridge Ward is different from the experience somewhere else. And I think that part of the correlation program uh, post-war, particularly in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was this idea of stressing that uh, a uniform church was a positive value, that having a franchised church experience that would be the same and be predictable everywhere was very good. And we are now really reaping the, the sorrow of that <laughs> particular um, conceit. Which may have been true in some ways at the time. Right? I mean, there's, the, there's an ebb and flow to how these things, to how these things work. So I guess connecting a little bit with this question about variation um, in, in experience in the church, um, depending on where you live. Jen, I think I want to, I think I heard you say something in your interview with Radio West. Um, although maybe I heard somebody else say it, but referring to the way that we tend to cycle in the church between retrenchment, and I don't remember the word that, okay, assimilation and retrenchment back and forth. Um, I guess I have, a, I have an immature desire to have everything just be fair and understandable. And so a cyclical... Sometimes we're retrenching and things that you used to be able to say you can no longer say. And um, the, the priesthood roulette that's talked about, you know, you're okay in this word, but try that in my word and you would lose your temple recommend. That sort of variation just upsets me on some basic levels. But I guess because we're living in reality, um, I, I am interested to hear from you, Jana, and from anybody who has something to say about it. Um, it, it feels like I want to collect strategies for how to um, how to finesse difficult topics in the tightest places. You know, something that I could have gotten away with in my ward in Massachusetts that I don't know if I can now get away with in my new ward in Orem. Um, it, I, it feels to me like it would be nice if we could share insights and I don't know what the platform is for this, so I'll just take whatever you have to say, but it would, it would be lovely if we could start to understand what in this fallen world we can use as good techniques so that we, we do as little damage to our own spiritual selves while trying to navigate our, um, you know, temple recommend interviews, or I don't know, I don't know what, so go ahead. I'll just answer the first part of that and hope that other people on the panel can answer the second part. So the first part, which is about this, this thesis of Armin Moss, Assimilation and Retrenchment. This is from a 1994 book called The Angel in the Beehive, which I would highly recommend for everyone to read. It's very accessible. And I think that it does a better job than anything I've ever read at explaining how the pendulum swings in Mormon history between these two things, assimilation, which is the beehive, and retrenchment, which is the angel. What's particularly confusing for me as a Latter-day Saint is that I feel that we are living in a time where both things are happening simultaneously and it's very whiplash inducing. You know, we go to a general conference and we find, okay, two hour church and okay, we're going to have a ministering program and you know, all of these interesting positive changes but suddenly you've all been handing victories to Satan by saying the word M something <laughs> and every previous prophet was wrong about that. So that's retrenchment happening at the same time as assimilation. And so it can be confusing to navigate that at the same time. And I would say that in terms of like navigation, I feel like that's what I, that, that was a huge part um, when I was an active and participating LDS person, that my participation in the Mormon feminist community really helped me with that particular piece. 
when I um, became involved with the Ordain Women organization and was involved with on the first board, we had a packet called the um, Productive Conversations Toolkit, and we drilled and practiced that a lot. And that involved a number of very useful um, strategies for building relationship and for, in the middle of a difficult conversation, um, trying to find common ground. So there, w there was a particular time when my bishop was like, so I saw you on the news the other day with ordained women. Um, that could be a real problem here. Tell me about that. And then I went on to tell him a very faith promoting story about like my involvement with ordained women, which he was not expecting. And so then, it, and then because that was very much a part of my faith, he was like, okay then. And then, you know, we had to revisit that conversation a few times. But I think that um, one of the things that Mormon feminism often does for people who are involved in the movement is to help people navigate the trickiness of life in church. You know, as a maybe, maybe a differently believing person or maybe a not differently believing person, but to kind of take, okay, well, you know, what kind of outcome do you, what kind of outcome are you seeking? And, you know, what are you willing to do or not do? And to offer strategies around uh, just the navigation process, which is very tricky. Janet, can I hop in? Okay. So in the last 48 hours, so I teach here at EVU, um, but I'm also a seminary teacher. So in the last 48 hours, um, I have taught a cycle, an A class cycle and a B class cycle in two days, 200 students. Of those 200 students, I just asked them, how many of you have seen the temple robes? Uh, less than 50% had. Now we're actually in the curriculum there, you know, in 88, 95, 109, 110. So just an FYI, our st my students, generally speaking, are not seeing this prior to they go to the temple. Um, I think there is something on the shoulders of adult members of the church for not accessing this necessarily. The temple robe video on YouTube that came as a result of the Mitt Romney election, that's 2012, right? Within the last four weeks, another video specifically on the endowment was released. And so I had to be careful because I just showed them the video that's on the church's website and we walked through it. My students do not know where a name that they do a baptism or a confirmation, they do not know where it goes. So I think there's been a culturation on, the, on behalf of, on the part of the parents where we grew up in a shh area, and yet the children are not growing up there, but they're not being exposed to it when the church's website is opening the door wide open. Now, granted, they're not standing at the pulpit and saying, go do this, but it's just right there. It's just very, very available. And so in the last 48 hours, 200 students have been able to see the temple robes. They've been able to walk through the temple endowment and I've been able to do that in a way that's completely appropriate, um, maintaining agreements and covenants. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I have had to say, now, when you go home and your parents may ask you what happened today in seminary, <laughs> you have got to tell them everything came off of what was formerly known as LDS.org. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's just kind of, an, that's kind of in the trench last 48 hours. <coughs> And I just tell my students, this is on adults. In part, this is on adults who are acculturated in a different time and in a different place. And as a boomer, I'm kind of a straddler because I remember prayer circles in my home. I went to a ward in Provo that had had prayer circles mm -hmm. in that church building 100 years ago. So I, that was way too long, but maybe of interest. Anyone so I'd, I'd love to add something. Um, I think that it's really important, like Blair is saying, to, to talk about these things and share these things, but I have found as a woman that it is often easier for my husband to say certain things and get away with certain things that if I said them in the exact same tone, exact same everything, it would be more radical 
it would be more threatening. And so the thing that, that I have learned to do, and, and I should state that I'm a believer, and so I, I feel like when I do this, I, I really do it with my heart and soul, is I arm myself in Jesus. You can find examples of almost whatever you're looking for with the Savior. So if somebody you know, comes at me with some of this stuff, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I learned how to be a mother from Jesus. The language of the Savior is, oh, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks. There is nothing more maternal than that image. And that's the Savior. And I can remember sometime, one time someone kind of giving me a hard time about going off to an exponent retreat and sort of saying, well, you know, you're leaving your family. It was probably my mother. Um, I didn't say that, Mom, sorry. Um, and I remember saying, well, you know, Mom, if you look at the Savior, after he, he worked with um, his disciples and with the crowds, there were times where he went off. This, they went off on their boat, and he went off to retreat, to pray. And if the Savior needs to be renewed, then certainly I do. People can't argue with Jesus. They just can't. You know, and then he goes back and, and his disciples, there was a storm, everybody's crying, they're freaking out, why did you leave us, Jesus? If you had been here, none of this would have happened. And, you know, and the mom thing to do is, well, I'm never leaving again. I'm not allowed, you know, this is why we can't have nice things, <laughs> you know. But you just have to look at the Savior and think, you know, you might have messes, you might have storms to deal with. But we have to retreat. We have to go and, and find our voices and, and find our calm and find our peace. And people won't argue with Jesus, even if you're a woman. Who's next? Sure. Oh, sorry. I'll add a couple of thoughts. Um, um, <clears throat> I like what you said, Heather, about people can't argue with Jesus. I think people can't argue with Eliza R. Snow either. <laughs> and I use her all the time. So to answer Nancy's question, is she reliable? And I would like Lisa to weigh in on this. Is she reliable? From my research, she is. And in fact, extremely so. And, and in ways that we can use her. She's not shy about asserting her authority and the authority of the Peru Society and talking about the temple and women's authority from the temple, and she's saying it in the exponent. And she's asserting it in public. In 1842, you know, she writes that article in the local paper, Relief Society, what is it? It is an order. She's asserting, you know, all along the way, saving the minutes, asserting these are our law and constitution. It's like the female doctrine and covenants. She's preserving it because that's where women's authority and priesthood is located to some extent in the document. And, and she's asserting over and over again. I mean, in, in 1884, she asserts in the Women's Exponent that the Relief Society is a self-governing organization. And the women go to their leaders and upline to the local president and then the stake and then to the general. They don't go to the bishops. They don't go that route. In fact, when I was excommunicated in 1993, I wrote, a letter to the state presidency saying, you don't have the authority to judge me. And I cited Eliza R. Snow, and I, s and I copied the letter to the really, it actually the letter was written to the Relief Society presidency saying, the state presidency doesn't have the right to judge me. The Relief Society presidency has the authority to judge my case, the state presidency doesn't. And here's what Eliza R. Snow said, because saying that sh th the Relief Society has the authority. So anyway, um, I think she's consistently asserting female authority and priesthood and so her statement about that, you know, in the temple that women um, were anointed to be queens and priestesses to the Most High God, I think it's a reliable statement. But I want to hear Lisa respond to that specifically. And I was going to say something else I can't remember now. Oh, just there are, there are in our excavation of what women's priesthood and authority looked like prior to the succession crisis and Brigham's ascendancy and the move there are so many shards in excavating that, there are so many pottery shards of women's priesthood. And, and I've been amazed since coming back to the church how many more sources I've found beyond the ones we've been citing for 30 years. There are more. And um, it's fascinating how many of these little pottery shards of women's priesthood are located in the soil of our 
documents in, in our history. So anyway, I wanted to hear Lisa respond to the reliability of, of Eliza as, as a source. I guess I'm not exactly sure what we mean by reliability. I think the accounts that we have of her words are reliable. I think Eliza is a woman of unparalleled power and, and spiritual power and authority. Um, as a historian, I see records of the past and words of the past in very complex ways in their contexts. So I think it's important to quote Eliza's um, very clear assertions of, of that spiritual power and authority. I think we also have to look at her statements about the Relief Society derives its authority from the priesthood and defers to the priesthood. There was a, a context of um, gender relations and the way that, that, that both men and women understood those things at the time that we have to grapple with. Um, so I feel, and, and I'm, I've said this in other venues, I feel that these sources are extremely precious and powerful, that they're very useful to think with but we cannot unproblematically go back and claim any given quote and say, this is how it should be today. There's a lot of babies and a lot of bathwater. And so I think, I think we have to grapple with all the complexities of these sources and their context, but by all means take inspiration from them. Your comment about babies reminds me of a family story that's not really related to this com conversation, but to our larger point about suffrage in the 19th century. Um, Andrew and Olive Kimball uh, lived in the 19th century, and in the 1890s, Olive was pregnant for the, I don't know, fifth time or something, I'm not sure, and she and her husband were discussing names for the child. And if w we're going to be a boy, Andrew w was thinking about naming it after his good friend B.H. Roberts and to call the baby Roberts. And Olive said, essentially, not on your life, he's not for suffrage. Mm -hmm. So that baby <laughs> was named Spencer, Spencer. Lily Kimball. That's a great story, and I really hope it's true. It is and true. if it's it not, it should be. Yeah. True. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Okay, me again. Um, I'd just love to hear from each of you on the panel, such a great collection of women. What one thing would you like to see the church change at this point? She wants just one thing. I mean, <laughs> I can't do just one thing. So I think the one thing that would kick off many changes would be to give women the priesthood. And, and that that would necessitate many more changes. I'll say, uh, I think we ought to be studying the essays that have been researched and that are available on the website formerly known as LDS, <laughs> who said that earlier. Um, and I, I have a personal uh, connection to race in the priesthood and because of my family, my son, and I would like us to be teaching these actively. Um, I know that it's being done um, in some wards, but it's not in all wards, and I want it to be I want it to be church-wide that we're studying these essays um, and that my children and their children are going to benefit from knowing the history of the church um, and looking at it from all angles. And these essays do a better job of it than any lessons that I've been taught growing up. So more of that. 
I probably also have a long list, but right now what, come, what comes to me is that I would like the church to recognize that there is grace and humility in apologizing. Power. I had it, now I've lost it. Oh, I know what it is. <laughs> Anytime a decision is being made within the church that affects any woman or girl, then a woman needs to be present and consulted for said decision. Well, I'll see that and raise it <laughs> to just say that we need women at all levels. We need women involved um, from the ground up and not simply here and there. Well, I thought of one. Um, I do have a whole list, but I'll just go with this one. Relevant to the work that I've been doing on millennials, um, it has just come become so clear to me what a poor job the church does of listening to young adults. And we have a wonderful program for mobilizing them, for having them serve missions, for involving them in singles wards. But we don't listen to them institutionally without, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the, the kind of listening that is where you are not attempting to change the other person, you're not attempting to drive home your own point, but simply to listen in order to get that person's perspective. I think this is, you know, this is the oldest first presidency that we've ever had historically. The generation gap has never been wider in Mormon history, and so that is a very important thing we ought to be doing. I would like to see uh, more ethnic and racial diversity in leadership. Um, and. I also, of course, would like to see more gender diversity in leadership, but I, th I think we can't separate those, that we need representation from all sorts of people um, in the highest levels to help bring about a, a healthier community. We are out of time, so I'm, I'm calling it. It's 4.30, and I'm thankful for all of you who came today and had comments. Thank you. Thank you.